Das Bild vor eigenem Schaffen So hocke ich in dumpfem Schweigen, gebannt, verwirrt vor meinem Eigen. Er schuf dich in verschwiegener Nacht, getrieben, peitschend angefacht, gedrängt, gepresst. In tiefer Not erstandest du mir ein Gebot. Blick ich auf dich, mein Angesicht, und lausche deinem Fern. Fritz Asher was born in 1893 in Berlin, the largest city in Germany and also its capital. It was a time of radical social change and rapid, widespread growth for the city. The need for an ever-expanding workforce was fueled by a steady stream of newcomers. In the capital of Kaiserreich, the focus shifted from high-ranking members of the hierarchy and from a well-established bourgeoisie to a melting pot of immigrants from vastly different backgrounds looking for freedom and a better life. Fritz's father, Hugo Asher, moved from Naugard, Pomerania to Berlin, and like so many others, he was opportunistic and in search of his best life. In 1891, Hugo married Mina Louise Schneider, descendant of a prominent Jewish banking family. Fritz was the oldest child and the couple's only son, His sisters Charlotte and Margaret were born in 1894 and 1897. In 1901, Hugo Asher decided to have his children baptized. Hugo himself formally left the Jewish faith as well. However, he never officially converted. His wife, Mina, didn't convert until much later, in 1936, shortly before her death. We do not know with certainty whether Hugo's decision was motivated by spiritual conviction, by the desire to fully integrate into German society, or by the fear of racial discrimination. What we do know is that German society continued to become increasingly nationalistic, and at the same time, hostile toward the Jews. Jews in Germany had been branded as a distinct and foreign race, now being referred to as Semites. They were looked down upon as being different, non-European, and were ultimately encouraged to assimilate into mainstream German society and convert to Christianity. Conversion to Christianity was thought to provide socio-economical and political liberties that were not otherwise available to those of Jewish descent. It was a precaution taken by many non-religious, non-practicing Jewish families to secure futures for themselves and for their children in Germany. In 1918 and 1920, Hugo married off both of his daughters to non-Jewish Germans. He does so before dying a natural death in 1922. From 1887 until 1888, Hugo Asher studied at the University of Pennsylvania School of Dental Medicine in Philadelphia, which had gained an international reputation for the introduction of prosthetic dental techniques. With this knowledge, Hugo Asher developed and successfully marketed Asher's artificial enamel in Berlin. In 1909, the family moved from the center of Berlin to Zillendorf into a villa built by the star architect, Professor Paul Schulzen Nomberg. That same year, Max Lieberman, among the most respected artists of the time, recognized Fritz's talent and potential. Lieberman awarded him an art diploma and sponsored his enrollment at the Royal Prussian Academy of Art in Königsberg. Ludwig Detman, the dean of the academy, a friend of Lieberman and a co-founder of the Berlin Secession, changed the academy in Königsberg into a progressive school. Rather than emphasizing historicism, the value of a solid, practical education was emphasized by dynamic young teachers, like painters Olaf Jernberg, Otto Heichelt, and Richard Pfeiffer, and the printer Heinrich Wolf. In Königsberg, Fritz Asher met Ed Bischoff, who painted Fritz's portrait in 1912, and he began a long-lasting artistic exchange with Franz Domscheit, who later made a name for himself in his adopted homeland of South Africa. In 1913, a 20-year-old Fritz Asher returned to Berlin, 
which had become the third largest city in Europe, after London and Paris, with a population of almost four million inhabitants. Berlin had also become a leading European art city, along with Paris, Munich, and Vienna. Humorous sketches from Asher's formative years survive to this day, such as the brash woman in Kiss Rejected and the student on his knees before the artist in Rembrandt. In caricature-like ink drawings, Fritz captured Berlin's social life and the zeitgeist. At the same time, he created highly idiosyncratic pictorial representations of mystical and spiritual content. After returning from Königsberg, Fritz continued his studies with Lovis Corinth, Adolf Meyer, and Kurt Agte. He was active in the networks of the Berlin avant-garde and knew many artists, musicians, and performers personally. Influenced by expressionist artists such as the older Edward Munch, Emil Nolt, and Vasily Kundinsky, and his contemporaries Max Beckmann, Georges Ruwald, and Ludwig Meidner, Asher found his very own artistic language of intense colors and short, gestural brushstrokes, descriptive outlines, and fluid application of paint. Fritz subsequently began exhibiting his work in solo shows and group exhibitions, and continued to broaden his horizons, his influences, and his social circles. In 1914, Asher and his friend, fellow painter, Franz Domscheit, traveled to Norway and met Eduard Munch in Oslo. During a lengthy stay in Bavaria, he befriended the artists The Blue Rider and The Brook, as well as the satiric Simplicitsmus magazine. Among them, Gustav Mehring, Alfred Kubin, George Gross, and Katie Kolwitz. On June 28, 1914, World War I broke out. Within 12 days, Germany mobilized an army of 3.5 million military-aged men. Most of Asher's contemporaries joined the war effort, among them many fellow artists. Some were conscripted into service like Franz Mark or George Gross. Some enlisted with hopes of gaining control over their placement like Ernst Ludwig Kirchner, and others like Otto Dix and Max Beckmann enthusiastically enlisted. Asher did not participate, Instead, he continued to study and to work. In dynamic compositions like Lone Man from 1914, Fritz dealt with existential questions. The painting shows an isolated male nude, his head slightly tilted, standing before a stormy sky with closing eyes. Alone in a doomsday gloom, the figure stands hunching over, dismayed while boasting lean, strong muscles and disproportionately large hands. On one hand, the lone man appears physically capable of anything, and on the other hand, the figure seems as though he is ashamed, having just committed a terrible crime, and as though he has just been utterly defeated. In 1915, the young artist worked on depictions of the Passion of Christ and the Crucifixion, a theme that surfaced in many of his contemporaries' work before and during World War I. Asher's monumental painting, Golgotha, shows the crosses with Jesus and the thieves cast in shadow on the upper edge of the canvas, with an intensely yellow sun in the background. An enormous crowd surrounds the hill. On the right, a soldier on horseback holding a spear appears to be chasing the chaotic, panicking foreground figures away toward the viewer. Cloaked in colorful Middle Eastern robes, their faces, especially their noses, reflect generations of Northern European stereotypical depiction of Jews. With this composition, Asher drastically departs from the traditional iconography surrounding the subject of Christ. A year later in 1916, Asher took up the subject of the infamous medieval Jewish legend of Rabbi Judah Lowe from Prague, who fashioned a figure out of clay and brought it to life using God's secret name. With Golem, Asher chose an unmistakably Jewish theme, a popular theme in Germany during World War I, best known through the books of Judy Rosenberg and Gustav Mehrink, and the films of Paul Wegener. In Asher's painting, the golem towers over Rabbi Lowe and his two assistants. The golem creators are all gazing to the lower left, with eyes wide open in fear. Unthreatened and unmoved by what his human creators see, 
the golem gazes stoically, directly at the viewer. By juxtaposing the golem and the rabbis, by giving the golem a stronger, more stable, and even more human expression, Asher tells us the story of a powerful, universal savior of mankind, and forms a unique connection to the messianic figure of Christ. Fritz Asher was a Renaissance man who loved music, literature, theater, and opera. He composed music himself and sketched both stage productions and musicians. Especially Ludwig von Beethoven inspired him to create poems, drawings, and paintings. On stage, Asher was especially fascinated by I Pagliacci, composed by Ruggiero Leon Cavallo in 1892. In the tradition of the Commedia dell'arte, the opera tells the story of the performance of a comedy troupe in which fantasy and reality merge, and the cheated husband, Canio, ultimately stabs his wife, Nedda, and his rival, Silvio, on stage. The opera was very popular, especially because the main character, Canio, was sung several times by the famous tenor Enrico Caruso in the Berlin Opera. In numerous sketches and in a painting from circa 1916 and 1945, Asher visualized the tragedy. Asher himself seems to strongly relate to the emotional world of the opera's main subject, the clown, who makes others laugh as he himself inwardly weeps. In the early 20th century, the motif of the clown, the harlequin, was often identified with the figure of the artist. For Asher, the clown became synonymous to his own situation. Bajazzo, Narr, der ich bin, Topaz der Masse, ihr blödes Lachen treibt mich her. Je toller wird mein Spiel, Grimasse, je mehr ich grolle, kreischt es höher. Ich fühle, wie der Hund die Streiche, der wehrlos an der Kette zerrt. Pein kampft zu Schmerz, die Seele weint und Tod und Trauer schleichen. In 1918, depictions of divine judgment and hell became more frequent in Asher's work. World War I had ended with the utter defeat of Germany. Two million young men were killed and an additional 4.2 million wounded. In all, 19% of the German male population were casualties of the war. The population was starving. Workers went on strike in attempts to gain better working conditions. Asher captured the ensuing armed conflicts and failed uprisings in arresting sketches. Kaiser Wilhelm II abdicated the German and Prussian throne, and the Weimar Republic was founded. But the political situation remained unstable. The parties of the working class, the SPD, USPD, and KPD, tried to support the young republic and fought to secure the rights of the underprivileged while battling the parties on the right in 1929, the Great Depression further destabilized the country and ultimately led to the collapse of the Republic. Krieg Wie du es erwähnst, dir tausendfach gesteigert, starrt dir entgegen grauenhaft, dein Wesen, Mensch seine sich verweigernd. Es bricht herein in alle Weiten. Die Furie grellt und krallt sich ein. Inferno, der Verwüstung schrei, das Licht erlosch. An Dunkel brach's entgeistert. On January 30th, 1933, the National Socialists seized power. They immediately worked through their lists of political enemies and imprisoned social democrats, socialists, communists, and their sympathizers in penitentiaries and in concentration camps. Fritz Asher constantly changed his residence, first in Berlin and from 1934 in Potsdam. As a modern painter and Jewish born, he could no longer produce, exhibit, or sell his art. Ironically, Fritz's baptism and confirmation did not spare him from being persecuted. On the evening of November 9, 1938, during Kristallnacht, the night of broken glass, 
Fritz Asher was one of nearly 3,000 Jewish men who were arrested and deported to Sachsenhausen concentration camp. After a two-month internment in Sachsenhausen, Fritz was immediately rearrested after his release and incarcerated at the Potsdam police prison for another four-month bid. Finally, after six months, Asher was released a second time, this time under the condition that he report every week to both the local police station and to the Gestapo. Beginning September 19, 1941, he was forced to wear a yellow star. In June 1942, Police Chief Warden Heinrich Volber warned Fritz of his imminent deportation. Asher went into hiding in the Grunwald Residential District of Berlin, where family friend Marta Grossman hid him first in her apartment and later in the cellar of a bombed-out mansion in a neighborhood of aristocratic mansions overtaken by Nazis and near the Grunwald Railway Station, where mass deportations of Berlin Jews had begun. For the next three years until the end of the war, under constant fear of discovery, Fritz Asher managed to stay hidden in Berlin, not far from his family home in Zehlendorf. Unable to paint or draw, he turned to poetry. Until the end of the war in 1945, he composed numerous poems, many of which are steeped in visions of love and the divine evoking nature as a place of refuge and as a spiritual home. These poems give a glimpse into the artist's innermost feelings and can be understood as Fritz Asher's unpainted paintings. Many of Asher's artworks, which he had left with friends, were destroyed in an Allied bombing just three days before the official end of the war. Kein Leben ohne Träne kein Sehnen ohne Schmerz, durch Tiefen und durch Höhen in Einsamkeit verscherzt. Kein Jubel, der's bekundet, kein Glück, an dem gesundet, dein Herz dir sagt, mein Werk. Leben um Leben Du schreiest um dein schönes Streben, wenn es ein Schicksal dir zertritt. Du schreitest durch der Blüten weben und mordest jeden Schritt, die Leben, die banget dir entgegengeben, Verdichter unbedachten Glücks. At the end of the war in 1945, Germany and Berlin lay in ruins. Only a few thousand Jews survived the Nazi era in Germany. About 1,400 remained in Berlin. One of them was Fritz Asher. He stayed in the Grunwald district and moved in with Marta Grossman. The two of them would remain in each other's care the rest of their lives. Once sociable, likable, and tagged with remarkable potential, the artist now lived drastically withdrawn from society, the public, and the art scene in Berlin reducing his outside contacts to a handful of friends and neighbors. He declined a teaching position. In 1969, only months before he died, legendary Berlin gallerist Rudolf Springer finally convinced the artist to show his work in a large solo exhibition. This would be the last time Asher would exhibit his work in his own lifetime, work that would then remain unseen, not exhibited, until 2017. After Hitler's defeat, Asher continued to live in Berlin with his mother's friend Marta Grossman, a block from his former hiding place. He immediately returned to making visual art while remaining largely withdrawn from society. Initially, he repainted some of his surviving early works with colorful dots and streaks in an expressive version of pointillism. But soon he turned away from his figurative compositions of the Weimar era and started painting vibrant and richly textured landscapes, inspired by the long walks through the nearby forest. The emotionality of his early work is replaced by a no less intense, almost obsessive relationship with the subject of nature. Following his wartime poems, which hymnically praised and described nature, he now created intense paintings and gouaches of sunrises and sunsets and of flowers and trees. Faithful to his expressionist sensitivity, his colors remain bright and intense, and his paint strokes spontaneous. Glowing sunrises and sunsets show new life, 
confidence, and optimism. Fritz Asher reportedly worked with immediacy and with urgency, fast, almost ecstatic, dramatically simplifying forms and medium. Collector Carl Elvanger described Asher working as someone seemingly in a trance, as someone not entirely present, but rather in his own world. The artist would walk the length of the room, adding a brushstroke here and there, and then walking back, a constant back and forth. The conception and construction of these landscapes are markedly simpler and more direct than anything in Asher's earlier pictures. They are conspicuously individual and personal. The Grunwald is well known for its ancient tree population of pines and oaks. Trees is a pre-war canvas, painted over in 1949, in which heavy-trunked pines fill out the entire picture plane. Leaning into each other, the trees seem to form a wall of resistance, having outwitted many storms and seasons. The viewer is not allowed in. Trees in a Hilly Landscape is Asher's last dated painting from 1968. Again, heavy-trunked pines fill out the entire canvas. However, between the two massive, close-standing trees on the left side and an isolated tree on the right, a wide landscape meets a cloudy sky in the horizon. In contrast to those heavy-trunked trees, Fritz also represents thin-trunked trees that seem exposed to the elements, fragile and vulnerable to the forces of nature and to human will. Asher's tree and flower paintings can be seen as celebrations of the resistance and continuity of nature. The intense color of these paintings evokes changing light, times of day, weather, and seasons, while the vibrant brushwork declares the power of growth and the constant changes of the natural world. They emerge standing, confronting us, each as distinctive as any individual person. By the end of 1968, the villa at Bismarckley 26 was sold, and Fritz Asher was forced to move. The villa was demolished in 1969, and Fritz Asher died just a few months after that on March 26, 1970.